Thank you all for coming. We have right now 77 participants. Wow, thank you. We're gonna begin by um, asking Mr. Lewis Gantman, who is a member of the Auschwitz Memorial um, Foundation to share with us last year, one year ago, why he was in Poland and what his relationship was with the um, commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Mr. Gantman, Mr. Lewis Gantman. Yeah, thank you um, for the introduction and, and more importantly for the privilege of speaking to this group. Um, I've had the pleasure of getting to know Leo Schofer and Gail over the past 15 months and I can't imagine two more dedicated volunteers and professionals in their respective roles. And, and I, I, the, the Resource Center is so lucky to have their support in everything that they do. Um, it was a year ago today that I sat um, in a tent with 2,000 people, 220 survivors whose average age was 93 who came to bear witness to the 75th anniversary of the liberation of the largest Jewish cemetery in the history of the world, Auschwitz-Birkenau. And as moving as the event was then, and it was the most moving Jewish experience I've ever had in my life, um, in ref on reflection, dealing in the midst of a world pandemic, it was the last international gathering of any size in the world right before COVID started. So in addition to the um, major import it had in the lives of Jews throughout the world, it was also the, the last major gathering of, of human beings pre-COVID. And I think the best way for me to share the experience was really to share stories because there's no way you can convey the, the power um, in my mind of the experience rather than through stories. So I'm gonna tell three stories shortly. The first was I had the privilege the day after the commemoration, we toured Birkenau with various board members from the Auschwitz-Birkenau Memorial Foundation and some survivors. And during part of the trip, there was a woman who was 94, very frail and we pushed her around Birkenau in a wheelchair. Um, she wanted to see everything. And it was my turn to be pushing the wheelchair. And we had to cross through a gate to join the rest of the group where the, the person was telling the story and a very jarring story, which I won't share now, but I couldn't navigate the chair through the gate. It was too wide. So I said to the survivor, I said, look, um, why don't we just stay here? I'll stay with you. We can hear everything that's being said. We don't have to walk over a hundred yards to where the speaker is. And she put her frail arm, hand on my arm. And she said, son, she said, 75 years ago, I walked out of here. And with your help, 75 years later, we'll walk over and listen to the speaker. And that is the power the determination and the will that enabled our ancestors to live through the Shoah. The second story was from a speech that one of the survivors, four survivors spoke, two Jews, two non-Jews. The Jewish male that spoke was spectacular. He was a journalist. And he said, my speech is dedicated not to you people out in the audience, not to my fellow survivors, but to my daughter. And the title of my speech is Auschwitz did not fall from the sky, which sounded like a very funny title of a speech. And he said, I'll recount what it was like growing up as a child in Germany. He said, first I came out into the park and I saw a sign on the bench that said, no Jews allowed. And I was a kid and there were other benches and it, it really didn't matter because I just sat on a different bench. And then a couple of weeks later, there was a sign 
in the swimming pool where we went swimming that said, no Jews allowed. And that was okay because there were other swimming pools. So I went to a different swimming pool. And then there was signs on the stores that said, Jews can only shop during these hours. And I said, well, that's okay because I can shop during those hours. And he said, um, that's the problem. I said it was okay. And it wasn't okay. And he said, whenever, ever, people are treated differently because of who they are, because of their religion, because of the color of their skin, for whatever reason, they're treated differently. We can't be indifferent. We have to react. And that's why Auschwitz didn't just fall out of the sky. Everyone knew it was coming. Everyone in Germany knew it was coming. Everyone around the world knew it was coming and no one did everything, anything. And that indifference is what we can't ever endure again. And I'm sorry to say this, but it's a two minute warning just because we have a time. I got it. I'm on my last speech and it's two minutes. Um, the last story was uh, Ambassador Ronald Lauder, who's the chairman of the foundation and is just I'm sure most of you have heard his name, a remarkable, remarkable man, gave a riveting speech. And I'll just recount one of the stories. Uh, it was during the Nuremberg trial, and there was a female prosecutor who was questioning one of the male survivors. And, and he was telling the story how he and his wife and his daughter were on the cattle car and huddled together. And they all had whatever clothing they had on their back. Their daughter happened to have a uh, red coat. And they vowed that they would never be separated when they got to Auschwitz. And of course, we all know what happened. The doors opened, they were thrown out of the train. And within minutes, the daughter and the mother were led one way and, and the father was led another. And he couldn't believe it. And he was so incredibly sad. And the prosecutor kept asking questions and she said, well, what happened next? And he said, I just kept looking at my daughter and my wife walking in the distance. And there were a lot of people. And the only way I could see them was um, my daughter's red coat. And that red coat got smaller and smaller. And then the prosecutor stopped asking questions. And the judge said to the prosecutor, excuse me, counselor, what's the problem? She says, I want to take a recess. So the hearing stopped. The attorney left the room and she came back in. And she said to the judge, judge, um, I, I, I don't have any more questions for this witness. And the judge said, I don't understand. Why would that be? She said, I can't ask him any more questions because Yesterday, I bought my daughter a red coat. And I can't ask him any more questions. And she sat down. So from different perspectives, different stories just showed the power and the strength of our people to overcome what they did. And for me, it was a, a personal privilege to be there. So, thank Gail, you. thank you very much. Thank you for the powerful introduction. And, and if you were interested, um, you can use the chat to communicate with Mr. Gantman uh, representing our Auschwitz Memorial Foundation. Please use the chat if you have any questions that you want to ask any of the presenters today. And uh, Morgan uh, Everman from our Holocaust Center will be uh, posing the questions. For teachers, uh, New Jersey educators, if you're earning the PDH uh, certificate today, just let us uh, know. And uh, for our Stockton students, Osprey Advantage, just let us know in the chat. We have two Holocaust survivors today. One is uh, Maud Dami, who was a hidden child in the Netherlands. And um, we'll just ask you, Maud, to give a wave right now to so many of um, your friends that know you and love having you here with us today. And our other Holocaust survivor is Rosalie Simon. For Rosalie, 
This was a long journey going back to Auschwitz on the 75th anniversary because she had never been back to Auschwitz, never been back to Poland since the war. She did, and I see Marianne is on our Zoom with Marianne McLaughlin. She wrote this book, A Girl in a Striped Dress, which Doug Servey will speak about in a few minutes. But Rosalie, I know it's so hard, but could you share with us just what it was like going back for you? And we also want to rec uh, welcome your family members who are here, grandson Eric, who was with you in uh, Poland, Ruth, your daughter, who was with you in Poland, and sons Mitchell and Bill. Thank you, Rosalie. So um, when I saw the sign, Arbeit macht frei, I couldn't believe that I'm back to Auschwitz. But what made me happy that I'm here and I survived. But it was a very emotional trip. Going to the uh, museum in Auschwitz was tough. Uh, when I saw, when I saw the replica of the guest chamber, how the people were lying dead on the floor one on top of the other children. I was in shock. I, 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 I thought to myself also many other things that I saw in a, a little sweater in a, in a case, a baby sweater, uh, braids, uh, shoes, eyeglasses, thousands. I couldn't even cry. I was so angry that the whole world was silent. And how could this happen to a whole race of people? Nobody spoke up except for the Gentiles that saved the Jews, thank God for that. But it was, it was very, very tough for me to see that again. I was walking, I was walking the street where my mother and little brother was walking straight to the guest chamber. And I was there with them, but I don't know why I turned around and, and ran back. I think I was naive and I, I was 12 years old and I thought I will get my sisters to join with us. So I left my mother and I ran back to get my sisters. It was just an idea that I had. I didn't know what I was doing. So I was very upset after I came to my sisters and I was surrounded by SS and they told me you can't go back. And so I had to stay there and that's how I got saved the first time on the day of arrival. There were some, there were some nice times too in Auschwitz and Krakow. I was going to tell you about the, uh, the red coat that, that uh, Ronald uh, spoke about and that was very, very emotional. So this day when he sees a red coat, he said, he thinks of that child in Auschwitz. So uh, it was a very emotional speech that he made and he was so right saying, where was the world when we were being slaughtered? And then also he said there's anti-Semitism all over the world including the United States. And we know that, we know that. Look, 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 even at the, at the uh, 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 capital, there were signs, six million Jews, not enough. So it is pretty sad what goes on in the world, but that's the situation. 
Anyway, on, on, on the other hand, in Auschwitz, uh, they, we went out to dinner. And that was a very, very memorable evening. We were outside. It was dark. The storks were shining. It was, it brightened up the whole, the whole area. And everybody lit a candle. All the survivors lit a candle. The first to light a candle was a 70 year old woman because she was the youngest there. She was born in Auschwitz. Her name is Angela Oros, R-O-S-Z. R -O -S -Z. And she weighed two pounds, a little over two pounds. And the mother, it's, it's on the internet how she survived. I found her on the internet. So she was so weak that she couldn't even cry. She was covered with a blanket and there she laid. Every time the mother went to Selapel to be counted, she wasn't sure if she would find her alive, but she did. So she survived and she's 70 now and she has a story to tell. Anyway, the second best thing that happened, I, missed, I met uh, uh, students outside from Italy and I told them the story of the Holocaust. I approached them and I said, I told them the whole story. They hugged me and they kissed me and we took pictures and I was so happy to tell him that story because it's so important for students to know what happened in case they don't know. Also, I met a group of students from San Diego, teenagers, high school kids. And we got together and I told them the story as well. And I have a large picture that they sent me with writings and I treasure that. And I, I was at their Zoom graduation. And uh, we talked afterwards and it was a very, very good experience. Everybody held up the candles. It was dark at, at outside at the, at the uh, half dollar and it just lit up the whole area and everybody sang. We sang the Hatikva and we sang Hebrew songs. And I, I felt so happy because of what we have accomplished and, and, and where we are as people with names, not numbers. And then we went inside to have dinner and I was sitting next to some women that told me their story. One of them was six years old and the whole, she, she was in uh, Auschwitz, not Birkenau. And the whole block was taken to the crematory, to the gas chamber. Something happened to go wrong with the system and they took him back to the barrack and how then that's how she survived. The other woman told me I was in I was in line going on a transport. I'm from Vienna. And whoever went on a transport on a walk a walk hardly survived. They couldn't survive. But what happened? It was nearing towards the end of the war and she went over to the Gestapo. There was a, a, a transport from uh, Gentiles that did something. Uh, they were locked up for some reason. 
And she said to the SS, you know, I belong to that transport with Vienna, with the Viennese, and I lived in, in uh, Vienna, and I want you to put me on the train. I want to go back to Vienna. Well, he did. He put her on a train because she wasn't Jewish. The other, the other uh, transport was Jewish, but she wasn't, so she was able to go back home. All kinds of sad stories. Everybody was, I was talking to everybody. But these were, these were the happy times in Auschwitz, talking to the students and being outside with candles lit. And, um, and I enjoyed that. And we met some very nice people, nice friends. And uh, we had, we were treated royally. Everybody was so nice to us. You are an excellent educator, Rosalie. You taught us just in that short period of time so much. And I'm segueing, segueing into introducing another educator and that's Doug Servey. Okay. He taught at Oakcrest High School for 30. 41. <laughs> 41 years. And um, don't think we let him go. So Doug joined us here at Stockton he is part of our adjunct faculty and every year, every academic year teaches two to three courses. And he got snagged and I'm saying that with a smile. He was appointed by um, Governor Murphy as director of the New Jersey Commission on Holocaust Education. And we're so proud because he's homegrown from South Jersey. So Doug, would you share with us your experiences and your PowerPoint? So thank you every, everyone for taking the time to see this program today. I could sit here and listen to Rosalie the entire time rather than listen to me because I'm only you know, somebody from the outside as well as Maud and her story. Um, and then also, you know, having had Marvin's mother come into my class and share her story and, you know, for, for the program to be one of the best programs in the United States, and I'm obviously biased the way Stockton University is, but I was very fortunate to have, you know, go through the graduate program here. Dr. Berenbaum, which you'll see in, in some of the slides that I have, um, I still don't know how this man did this. He flew in on a Wednesday night from Los Angeles, taught the class from six to nine, hopped on a plane back to Los Angeles. He goes, well, I get a lot of work done on the airplane. I says, better than you than me. But in any event, I can sit and listen to him as well. Um, I was very fortunate um, to be able to ask to go with the Wishnia family. So I became Doug Wishnia. Uh, when I was over in Poland, I think there was only one Doug Wishton. Everybody kind of laughed about that. But my experience goes back 48 years ago when I had, I had never even heard the word Holocaust before until I was a senior in college. And as a result of that, 48 years later, here I am, which I think is one of the most important subjects that I will ever teach and needs to be taught, especially in the climate, which Rosalie mentioned. I was stunned when I couldn't, that guy had that shirt on. It said, you know, Camp Auschwitz. And on the back, he had staff. I go, seriously? And a Confederate flag, which is actually the Ku Klux Klan flag in my Capitol building, having served in our military, I was appalled at that. Hopefully, obviously, things will change. But with programs like this, there is a lot of work to be done. And all of us, as Elie Wiesel said, once you've heard a witness, you become a witness. And at 6 o'clock, when I have my class tonight by Zoom, because Gail wouldn't let me come on campus tonight, um, that's what I tell my students. I'm not really teaching you. I'm teaching your children so that this story is passed on to the next generation. In the 41 years that I taught in high school, I had six students tell me the Holocaust did not happen. I ended up in Auschwitz in 1996. Our son was six, eight months old at the time. My wife was ready to kill me. But the students said, how do you know you've never been there? So Paul Winkler, who was the executive director at the time, had a trip going for the first time. So I went on that trip where I met David Wishnia, which you'll see pictures of him. And I'll tell his story a little bit, you know, once we get to the program and so forth. But thank you very much for everybody coming. Um, hopefully we'll all be able to tear and share with you if you haven't been there before. And those that have been there, it is a life-changing experience. There's no question about that. One of the reasons that the commission led by Maud Dami every summer, which unfortunately for the last two years we've had to cancel, 
is an experience that they can bring back to their classroom, which there's nothing that can supplement that. Um, you can read the books, you can listen to the survivors, you can watch the film, but to walk on that ground, on that sacred ground, is an experience one will never forget. So I'm gonna screen share right now. And if I hopefully have this. Gail, are you gonna see this? We're good, Irving? We're good. Okay, thank you. Um, as you can see, I'm now the executive director of the New Jersey Holocaust Commission, and I've done about enough Zoom meetings for a lifetime in the last two weeks. We're meeting with every center to find out what their problems are and what their successes are. And it's amazing what these people are doing. It's incredible the work that all of the centers are providing for the educators and people around the country. Like a lot of things are being seen all over. Like last night we were on a program, myself and Brianna, who's my executive assistant, uh, did a program with Ben Lesser. And I'll tell that story a little bit later uh, from Las Vegas. And they had hundreds of people participating in that or through his program. And I was asked to look over their curriculum that they have now uploaded um, on the internet. One of the things also is we, for the teachers that are watching right now, you can go, our site's being redone, uh, which Brianna, unfortunately for her, has to take care of that. And we're on a daily basis uploading new information that we get as we revise the curriculums, which is gonna take a lot longer because of COVID. And God bless Barbara's on here today for their, spending their time on this. Oh, I gotta do it this way. Most of you are well aware of this. This is where we ended up on the last day, which I'll give to eventually. And this is where David Wisner used to sing to the SS officers and his life was saved before that. And everybody knows this beautiful woman, uh, Rosalie, and this was the dinner that she was speaking about. And this is Dr. Berenbaum, who was one of my graduate professors. And this just was a wonderful night. As Lewis had mentioned, there was 226 survivors there, which was an amazing event in and of itself, which we'll eventually get to. Uh, this is a picture which I took with Rosalie and her daughter, Ruth. Eric, I'm sorry I didn't take one with you there, uh, but this was just a wonderful evening. And to be able to see somebody from South Jersey, you know, 3,000 miles away um, in Auschwitz was a very, very lovely evening, needless to say, knowing what was going to take place eventually in the future. Uh, this is David Wisnia, who's who's lived about two and a half years in Auschwitz and also a World War II veteran, and his son, Rabbi Eric Wisnia, up in Levittown, Pennsylvania. Unfortunately, David doesn't Zoom. I will get a FaceTime phone call from him periodically. He doesn't even know he's FaceTiming. Um, but he's in an assisted living facility right now, and he's unable to do this with the technology that we have. This is the book that Gail had told you about. Um, if you want to order that from Comtech, all you have to do is type in the title and Rosalie's name. That will come up, and you can order the book. Do yourself a favor and read this with Mary Ann McLaughlin, who edited all these books through the Writers Project, through the Holocaust Resource Center um, that Sarah and Sam Schofer's is, uh, Leo has done with his family. Or there's like, my students have to have a requirement every year that they read one of these every semester. Um, President Zelensky walked by, I asked him, did, was it a good phone call? And he goes, yeah, it was a real good phone call. I had to put that in there. My wife says, how did you meet this guy? I says, well, if you see the guys behind them, they're not really, they're basically the Secret Service taking care of this gentleman. So from there, we went to Sokachev, which is about 45 minutes west, excuse me, east of Warsaw, where David Wishney was born. He got there by train later on, and I'll come back to that story. And this is what's left. Um, at the time, in 1940, there were about 11,000 Jews in Sokachev. At the end of the war, there were zero. There were now 38,000 people in Sokachev. There was one Jewish family. They were not born there. They are doctors, they came from the outside because Sokachev's needs people in the medical profession. And David met that person and actually helped her son go to medical school in Poland and they returned back to Sokachev. 40% uh, of the village, of this village at the time was destroyed. This is where David's house was. Across the street was the synagogue and the school that he went to, the Hebrew school. Obviously these look very much like Russian buildings. I'm always amazed at the color yellow. They must have had a, you know, a, a sale on, on yellow for the Soviet Union when they started building these buildings in East Europe. This was, this is one of the few buildings that was across the street and you have like a small market down at the bottom. Um, and you can see the brick on the side where they replastered some of that, but most of the city was destroyed. This is also the birthplace of Chopin. 
This is the Jewish cemetery, which David and his family have donated to rebuild. Um, that's his daughter, Sarah, or granddaughter, Sarah, and his daughter-in-law that were also there with us as we traveled. They're actually making a film about this later on that's still not done. Um, and they've tried over a period of time to rehab the, the cemetery so that people know that there was Jewish life during the war, after the war, in spite of the fact that there's not a synagogue in town anymore. It's part of the history. And the people in Sokachev do know about that because David, speaking Polish fluently, obviously, uh, talked to the local population they did know, which is a good thing that their educational system is taking care of that. From Sokachev, David's family moved to Warsaw, where his father had a business. Um, he sang in the great synagogue at Warsaw. I didn't, there's not a, there, there's older photographs of that, but that's not there anymore because about 80 to 90% of Warsaw was destroyed during the war. So these are brand new buildings, but this is where his apartment was. And this is looking down the street. Um, and as you can see, these are older buildings that may have survived the bombings and so forth that took place by the Germans and eventually by the Russians during World War II. Um, from there, most of you recognize this as the ghetto fighters um, as far as the Warsaw Uprising. This is also the new location of the Polish Museum um, for, of Jewish Heritage, which is very, very well done. It's about three floors, David Sung. It was interesting because there was a high school class. There's about 300 people there, about a high school class that was coming through, and they all stopped when he started singing and then asking questions. I don't speak Polish. Um, but one of the people that was with us is Milos, who was the sound guy, and was explaining who this gentleman was. And they just stopped their tour and just listened to the rest of the concert that took there um, at that time. Most of you have seen The Zookeeper's Wife since I was in Warsaw. I was the only person on the trip that took a taxi because I wanted to see this place because the film. And they saved 300 people. You have Jan and Antonio. Um, and my Polish is terrible, needless to say, Zabinski which I'm glad David's not here because he would torture me. Um, but this is, this is the family, uh, the gentleman, this is Jan, um, this is his wife. Um, and from there, we went from left Warsaw to go to Krakow. A lot of people ask why Birkenau. It was amazing. And I love trains and this train well, was just wonderful. The number of birch trees from, you know, Warsaw on train, you know, going to Krakow was just amazing. Most of you that have been there know this is Krakow in the Krakow Center. This is over here on the side is where the Catholic Church is, where the guy blows the bugle every day, every hour. Um, and from there, we had a beautiful place to stay at the hotel. This gentleman is Ralph Hackman. He's a survivor at Auschwitz. He worked in the same sauna that David did, and they were best friends. They didn't find out that each of them had survived because they had gone on different death marches because they left at different times and found out maybe 20, 25 years ago that they were both survivors. Unfortunately, Ralph, they did a wonderful article that's in the New York Times, or excuse me, the Los Angeles Times, if you want to read it. He's the only person that was tattooed twice and also photographed. On the inside of his arm, the SS sergeant didn't like the tattooing that the guy had done and made him redo it. So that's on the underside of his arm the same number. And as far as he knows, and the archivist that we met says, we think he's the only person. Uh, but unfortunately, when he got back, January, February, into February, he died of COVID, which is terrible. From that night, we had dinner um, with Ralph, and they got to you know, talk to each other at length, which was wonderful. And from there, we went to Auschwitz, and those that have been there know exactly what this is. Um, as, as Rosalie had mentioned, Albrecht Mach Frey. Um, and this is down the side. And a lot of people sometimes say, why didn't more people escape? Well, if you've been to Auschwitz, you pretty well know up front why not. This is where the orchestra played. Behind this were the scene that they had. So the head archivist has actual documents with David's name on them, which is unusual because a lot of this stuff was destroyed. And this gentleman was pretty much out of his mind that he got to meet somebody who he had done research on at, at that. And we got, all of us got copies of this and which I obviously can use in my class now. And if you look down here, you can see 83256, which was David's number. Um, this is his grandson on the right, Avi, who's a tremendous musician. 
David loves to torture his son saying that, you know, the good singers skipped a generation because he does have an incredible voice, which you'll see later on. That is Milo. She's the guy who's a Polish gentleman that runs a sound organization for his kids. And we've kept in contact, which is wonderful. And he's doing well. I was unaware of this in 1996 when I first went to Auschwitz that there's two saunas. One that we saw was in the front of the building, which is on the women's side of the camp. And this is all the way in the back by crematorium three and four, which we'll see the inside in here in a second. So this is a pretty big, this is a big complex back here because everybody with that was given a real shower and then they took their clothes, they cleaned their clothes, they searched their clothes and so forth. And then they would then go across the street. Okay, as you can see here, all these buildings, and it's, it's difficult unless you watch maybe a drone footage of Auschwitz to the magnitude of how big this place was. And this was the barracks that were right across the way and right across the way was Canada, which a lot of people are aware of and the students that are studying this, where they took all the clothes, searched all the clothes, cleaned all the clothes and then shipped that stuff um, back to Germany to be resold because they made murder a business. And this is where David actually met his girlfriend that he had, Zippy, in the area of Canada across the way. This is the, this is the place which now they made into a museum that where people came in and undressed and then eventually take their showers. And I took these and I, my German is not real good. So a friend of mine, Bob Holden, I called him to ask him, could you make sure? Cause I looked up the translation and this translation says where the clothes were washed. The next one says the examination room. Below this is where the shower room was where people actually did get a real shower because they weren't gonna be murdered. And all the laundry was disinfected here. And the way this was done is that down here, the coal would be brought in to boil the water in these big, huge bins, all right, where they would boil everything, kill all the lice, and then eventually this is out the back window, you know, so far but so close as far as, you know, the escaping. And we are at the back of the Auschwitz-Birkenau camp, so this is Auschwitz too. And inside on the other side where they've turned this into a museum, there are thousands of photographs and everybody that you see in both of these were all murdered by the Nazis during the war, both Jews and non-Jews. That was a very sobering moment to walk in, not that the place in and of itself isn't, but some things hit other people at different levels, depending upon your own personal experience. Uh, this is what Lewis alluded to. There were 2000 people in this place. David was gonna sing at the very end, which you can still see, um, cause it's up on YouTube if you like. And as you're looking through, he eventually sang up front. There was a lot of dignitaries there, about 200, I would think, from kings and queens and presidents and secretaries of states. Um, and this is actually after it's all over and I'm taking these. This woman was part of the Polish Home Army that fought during the war and survived. Uh, there was a woman that did speak Polish, so I got to speak with her a little bit and she wanted to know why an American wanted to take her photograph. And I said, I'm gonna use these in my classes. So she was very gracious enough to have a picture taken with me. I think she said she was 84 years young, which is incredible of itself because there was a significant number of Poles that were murdered during the war. This is after the, the program is over. Uh, we took like a family picture, obviously. There I am is Doug Wishnia. Um, and we kind of laughed about that on the whole trip. This is David's book, which was also helped by Marianne McLaughlin, who did a fabulous job. If you want to order and read his story in more detail, you can. Um, you can just punch that into the internet and it'll bring it up for you. And this is the back of, all the way back at the camp, which I had never been there before. And this is like the sun setting. We're getting ready to go back um, to Krakow to have dinner. And it's getting late, needless to say. And this is where crematorium three and four were. There's obviously guard houses all over the place. This is back of crematorium four, which the Nazis blew up um, just prior to them leaving. This is looking back, and as you can see, the white tents, they are going and refurbishing these places part by part. And Lewis had a story that he told me yesterday that basically, I, I was in stun by what this Italian girl or German girl, I think, when he had told me had worked at Birkenau for like seven years, and she felt an obligation as a German Catholic to do her part to bring back this prosthesis that she was working on so that the person would be recognized and they would not be forgotten. And this was the last photograph I took as we left um, Birkenau, probably I guess at the time is maybe about quarter to five, five o'clock that evening. 
If you have any questions, please feel free um, to put these up. If you want to contact me as my job with the executive directorship for the state of New Jersey and you need educational materials, we're in the process of redoing. Um, Rosalie, thank you very much for taking a photograph of me. You are such a beautiful woman. And to be able to share this experience with other people, and I have a responsibility. To do that. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. I feel the way any of you have traveled and had the experience that Doug and I have had, as well as I see some of you, Elliot Beinfest, the Rennies, Leo Schofer, so many of you have traveled uh, with me, with Michael Birnbaum. You know what I'm talking about now, how we both feel. I know there's a couple questions, uh, Morgan. Uh, the first one's um, actually for Rosalie. And Rosalie, this is a question from one of our students. And she asks, um, what, uh, what was the biggest lesson you took away from your survival in Auschwitz? The biggest lesson, my yeah. survival in Auschwitz. Yes. Yes. Uh, was luck. It was God's will. And I uh, was just lucky to have survived because I, I uh, was chosen more than once by Dr. Mengele to go to the gas chamber. Being I was 12 years old, I wasn't, in his opinion, uh, able to work, but I was saved. And I feel blessed that I was survived and, uh, and brought into this world generations to come. And the lesson was to be tolerant, to be nice to people, that we are all the same and to speak up when you see something wrong and abuse of anybody. Thank you, Rosalie. Um, and we actually have two, two more questions for you, but I think you might have just answered one just now. Um, the first question is, um, you mentioned your sisters um, when you spoke earlier, um, and someone would like to know how many, uh, how many sisters did you have and did you all survive the war together? We survived together, and unfortunately, two of them died, and so we are three left. And uh, it was a big help having sisters in the concentration camp, because many times they helped me escape, risking their own lives, especially Charlotte and the other one, Helena, too. And I was lucky to have them. Uh, they could have been killed with me if we had been caught, but we were running all the time and they helped me run away from the place where I was locked up to go to the gas chamber. And Could you share with us the ages of your sisters? How you, you know, were you the youngest, the oldest and what their names were? So we can remember that story. The, not only the story about you, but the story about your sisters. I am, I am 89 and I'm the youngest. <laughs> My oldest sister was born in 1924. She passed away. The sister after Charlotte, my oldest sister's name was Helen. My sister Charlotte was born in 1920. Okay. She was born in 1923, Helen, and Charlotte was born in 1924. And Lenka was born in 1926, and Rose Risey was born in 1928, and I'm the baby, the 89-year-old baby. Thank you, Risley. And we also have one more question for you. And I think you've already spoken a bit to that um, in your very first answer. But the question was, um, we have many students and educators listening to you today. 
And what is um, a message or a lesson you would want them to know based on your experience? Uh, to, uh, the message to whom? To um, the students and educators. Okay, um, the message is to try to get along and treat everybody equally. And because we're all God's children and it doesn't matter whether we're white or black or, or, or whoever we are. And uh, we should just try to get along and be good to each other and respectful. I would like to share a story that you spoke to my students about, and perhaps you would feel comfortable talking about it, that you ended up at some point when you, you left Auschwitz-Birkenau in a factory, and there was a foreman that had a child around your age, am I right? Yes. Yes. And this would be something to leave all of us with today because we never know. We never know. The lessons for today is we never know when we'll be in a position to make a difference in somebody's life. Maybe not to save their life. Maybe not, God forbid, to be in a gunfight or anything like serious like that but maybe to do some small gesture because you credited this man for helping save you and support you. So would you yeah. share that story and tell us a little bit about the slave labor factory that you were in? Okay, I worked, he was my boss. His name was Adolf Schoffs. He had a daughter who was my age her name was Elsa. He also had a son whom he disowned because he joined the Nazi party. This man was like 5'4", a small man, small in stature. But to me, he was 10 feet tall because he used to watch over me and say, Rosalie, it's your fault that there is a war making fun of the Nazis, that I am there working for no reason at all. And he used to bring me bread sometimes. And sometimes during the day, he told me, put your head down and I'll watch, sleep a little, I'll watch for the SS. And he really did. And once the SS came and found two potatoes in the oven, there was a little stove. And she said, whose potatoes are they? And my uh, sister had to admit they're her potatoes. So he said to her, you, whatever he, she called, she called her some bad name. People are starving and you hide potatoes. I'm gonna report you when we come back to the camp and you'll get it. Well, my boss heard that. And he walked over to her, she was a lot taller. She was about six feet tall. And he was this little man, five, four, and stood up to her and he said, if you have a heart, I beg you, not to report this woman. She's a good worker. She never reported her. But he risked his life because he was supposed to stand up for the for the uh, uh, so for the inmates. So he did a really big thing because she would have been beaten up. And uh, my sister was coughing and coughing, she had asthma. He brought her medicine. And I can't tell you what he did for us, what a great man he was. So after the war, we, uh, 
she, he also took her around the camp, his daughter, to see how we were locked up with the fences, with the wire fences. So after the war, we wrote a letter to his daughter to see if she needs anything. But her son got the letter and he wrote to us and he said, don't you ever write to my mother again. She had enough of you because the children, she must have told the children that the father is helping the inmates and the children were beating her up. And so he said, she had enough of you and this, I, we don't want to hear from you. So this is what happened. Rosalie, so many of us, just like me, and I think it's at least 10 years ago you told that story to my class. Yeah. We will not forget it. How one person can make a difference. And that's, that's the message for today. Definitely. One person can make a difference. And, I'm and going to let Doug be the concluder. I think there may be a question for him. Yeah, thank you so much, Rosalie, for sharing everything. Wow. Um, <laughs> um, Professor Servi, we do have some questions um, for you as well. Um, uh, one question from one of our mock students, actually, um, and she asks, uh, how many times have you visited the camps and how have um, educational materials changed and evolved over the years? I first went to Auschwitz in 1996. I swore I would not go back. I had Rabbi Cohn is one of my, my graduate professors who lives in Violin. He said he was going to go back to his village and then to Auschwitz and show us the barracks that he was in with his father. I came home and my wife says to me, you're going back again, aren't you? I said, how do you know that? She goes, I'm your wife. <laughs> and I ended up going back in 2001. And then this last a year ago um, on, in January, went for the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, which every time it's different because you see different things and you meet different people. Um, my opinion is that if everybody taught this and everybody visited Auschwitz or one of the camps, maybe someday we'd stop killing each other, as Rosalie said, and treat everybody with respect. And I remember riding back the first time with David from Auschwitz to Krakow, and one of the other teachers in the car asked him, will there be another Holocaust? And without even stopping, he goes, of course there will. And we were sort of surprised at that. He says, but he goes, if people we do the five things I'm going to tell you right now. Maybe we will not have another one and we can stop the genocides on this planet. One, treat everybody with honor, treat everybody with respect, with a sense of awe, um, healthy fear. And the last he feels is the most important. Make this a better world than it was before you came. Educational materials is just technology. There is, there is an abundance of material out there if anybody wants to get it. I mean, just look at the programs that have taken place in the last three days and for the rest of this week, you could literally be on Zoom from eight o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock at night if you want to further your education. And it's like anything else. The more I learn about this, the less I know. And I've been studying this now for 48 years. And I learn stuff from my students based on the research that they do. Uh, reading has become a lost art. I still am old school. I like a book in my hand, not an iPad. Um, but reading like, you know, students in college, they'll even tell me on their book reviews, I want you to know I read this whole book. And I said, well, that was the whole purpose of this. And you're a senior in college, and this is the first book that you read. And then they want to know. And I said, yes, the university has published about 75 of these stories. You're more than welcome to use the library for the second time in your college career. Um, so those things become available for everybody. So the technology and then if you were able to go on the trip, which I strongly suggest every teacher does, you know, take your camera. I took a thousand photographs and we would be here till 10 o'clock at night going through all of them and the stories that go along with those. But those things and your students, you know, give them projects to do. I mean, they love doing that kind of stuff. I mean, when, you know, one of the things that an art teacher did for Maud's book, he gave an assignment where you draw your own cover to her story. It was phenomenal what these kids do. Give them an opportunity, bring a survivor in. I mean, virtual learning probably is here to stay. I'll be, I'll be glad when I get back to my classroom, but I think you will never, like if anybody's outside of this state would have been able to participate in this, 
to hear what you know Rosalie had to say. And it's kind of shocking sometimes. And we did a program through Stockton. There was a guy in South Africa and there were people in Israel and all of us were doing the program, you know, through echoes and reflections with Yad Vashem. So the technology has a place, but I don't want it to replace in, in person teaching because you use that emotional thing that you, that you really, it's hard to get. 